Good morning. If you're visiting with us, we're thankful, especially to have you as our honored guest this morning and invite you to stick around for a few minutes afterwards and allow us to thank you for coming and worshiping God, God together with us today. We're going to look at a text in John, the 15th chapter, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. And what this chapter focuses on in the initial paragraph is the life of abundance that God wants us to live. I've talked about in a few previous lessons on the Gospel of John how this is a gospel of abundance. Jesus says in chapter 10, verse 10, for example, that I have come, they may have life and might have it abundantly. And so ultimately, this is, uh, th this idea of the vine and the branches, uh, is, is such that, that we are unmistakably connected to Jesus. And because as disciples of Jesus, we are connected to him, we bear fruit for God with a cup that that literally overflows with blessings and therefore uh, there's no taste for fleshly appetites when we are bearing that fruit of the holy spirit that we're talking about in the class on sunday mornings so rather than focus on fleshly worldly things Instead, there is great satisfaction, fullness, and joy to be found in God. That's not to say that walking with God is always easy. In fact, in the context here, Jesus has just tried to console his disciples. Even with great blessings that he spells out in these chapters, they face the real-world problem their Lord was about to be crucified. He was about to leave them, and they were about to lose their physical connection with Jesus. They were not particularly happy about that. In fact, their hearts were deeply troubled and saddened. And so the one who's about to be crucified is the one consoling them. And what he says in the context here in chapter 14, verse 1, is let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In verse 18, same chapter, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. He would continue to dwell in them, they in him, and he would send the Holy Spirit a comforter to provide peace and ongoing guidance. And he says in verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And all of this is a prelude to the first verses of chapter 15, where he develops this idea of the vine and the branches and, and reinforces this comforting thought. They would not be left to their own devices and their success would not be achieved independent of Jesus. He would go on to say in chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So even though I'm leaving, and even though I'm going to be executed as a criminal and, and leave you, I will still be with you and we will still have a precious relationship. And verse 4 of chapter 15 is, is kind of like a Johannine parallel to chapter 28 of 20 of Matthew, where Jesus says the last verse of the Gospel of Matthew, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm going to be with you. It's all going to be okay. And as he's developing this, he will say to them in verse 19 of John 14, John 14, verse 19, yet a little while, 
and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And then he says down in verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me, and I'll manifest myself to you. So this is not stopping. It's not coming to a screeching halt. It will continue on in new and exciting ways, which leads to the question on the part of Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but Judas, son of James, otherwise known in the other Gospels as Thaddeus, how are you going to pull that off? Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How will you be visible to us and invisible to everybody else? You may have watched the science fiction movie about an invisible person who's invisible to most people, and, and then one person sees that person. How in the world can that happen in the real world? How are you going to be visible to us but invisible to everybody else. And Jesus' answer in verse 23 is, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. No, I won't be here physically. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 about our relationship with Jesus, we walk by faith, not by sight. But the relationship, nonetheless, will continue. And even there, we have another Johanna in parallel, chapter 14, verse 23, such as Matthew 18, verse 20, where, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. I'll still be with you. Jesus' love is still there. Jesus' word is still there. And in fact, Jesus is still here. So in the last verse of chapter 14, the last phrase in that verse, Jesus says, rise, let us go from here. They're in an upper room somewhere in Jerusalem. And I take that last phrase, rise, let us go up from here, as an indication that they're now leaving the upper room. This is a possible scenario. I think it's probable that they leave the upper room and then they head down the stairs and into the night air, perhaps with torches to be able to see in the night. And on their way to the Mount of Olives, the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives where there is a garden of Gethsemane, they cross the Kidron Valley and along nearby terraces are ancient vineyards. Another perfect object lesson to reinforce the point. I don't know for sure if they come across a vineyard, but I think they probably do. It would be in the vicinity of, uh, of this scene right here. The lower slopes of the Mount of Olives that cross this Kidron Valley probably see some vineyards some vines and branches and grapes. And so Jesus is going to make a point using a new metaphor with vineyard, vine, branches, and fruit. And this is what he says. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this the Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy, my joy, may be in you, and that your joy may be full. There are a lot of groupings of sevens in the Gospel of John. And there are seven I am metaphors in the gospel. And this just happens to be the last one, the seventh of the seven. I am the bread of life, chapter 6, verse 35. I am the light of the world, chapter 8, verse 12. I am the gate for the sheep, 10, verse 7. I am the good shepherd, chapter 10, verse 11, and verse 14. I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 11, verse 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Chapter 14, verse 6. I am the true vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. Chapter 15, 1 and 5. What does that metaphor mean in a, in a practical way? Let me suggest to you at the outset, don't settle for less than what your relationship with God should be at its full potential. Don't settle. When you can flourish and thrive, have an abundance and bear an abundance of spiritual fruit. And if I were to elaborate just a little bit further, the whole purpose of this is so that we might have this abundant and shared joy. Verse 11, that's what he ends on. As he develops the whole point, he ends on, on verse 11, and it's all about this joy that is full. Well, I'd like to have that. How, how do I get it? You will have the joy if you glorify God, because that's why he puts you here. We spend our lives chasing all the wrong things, but it, if you genuinely come to terms with the reason God put you here, which is to glorify him, then your joy will be full. Well, how do I glorify God? And how do I know that I'm truly glorifying God? If you become a disciple, and not just any disciple, but a genuine, true disciple, then you will glorify God, and then your joy can be complete. Okay, I'm in. I want to be a genuine, true disciple. But how do I know if I'm not counterfeit, if I'm the real deal? If you bear much fruit, then you will be a genuine disciple. So it's bearing much fruit, fruit that so proves you to be a disciple of Christ, which enables you to glorify God, which enables you to have this complete joy. Okay, I, I want to bear abundance in, in fruit. How do I do that? You need to abide in the vine. Abide in Jesus Christ, and you will bear much fruit. If you're deeply and intricately connected to Jesus Christ, the fruit will come. It's, a, it's an inevitable byproduct. Okay. I will abide in Jesus Christ. How do I do that? 
you abide in Christ when you allow his words to abide in you, his love to abide in you, and you open your life to the Father's pruning. When you do those three things, you will abide in Jesus and in turn bear much fruit and in turn be a disciple and in turn glorify God and in turn you'll have the joy that is unsurpassable compared to anything this world offers. Now that's the preview of the lesson. I want to elaborate even further and take each of those points and spend just a minute or two on each one. Shared joy. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The same author of this gospel says in 1 John, the epistle, chapter 1, verse 4, I have written these things to you that our joy may be full. Complete, full, abundant joy on a relative scale, not 10%, not 50%, not 95%, but 100%. Off the charts, joy. If you're not joyful as a Christian, if that doesn't permeate your existence, somehow you're not doing this right. Walking with God fundamentally gives us a peace that passes all understanding and a joy that is out of this world. And if you're not fundamentally joyful and happy and rejoicing in God, again, you're not doing something right here. But how do you get the joy? You glorify God. By this, the Father is glorified. Verse 8. When we live to our high and holy calling, we come to realize that we will never ever be happy till we realize why we're here and, and, and come to terms with our purpose in life when we're not here for us. The joy will be found not in chasing our dreams and our agendas, but in glorifying God who put us here. We are here fundamentally for Him, not for us. And we'll never be at peace with ourselves. And we'll never be fully happy until we come to terms with our purpose for being put here. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Someone has said, God smiles when we love him supremely, trust him completely, obey him wholeheartedly, and praise him continually. Paul says it this way in Romans eleven thirty six, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. In this manner, so let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus teaches. And Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why, Peter? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's 1 Peter 2, 9. Our whole purpose is to glorify God. And when we finally come to terms with that and are, are doing it, then we are living the dream that God has for us. We're living up to the purpose for God, for which God put us here. And then we can have that, that unbelievable joy.
But how do we glorify God? And how do we know God is glorified? When we become genuine disciples. Not counterfeit disciples, genuine disciples, true disciples who are proven genuine followers of Jesus Christ. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus is interested in us being genuine about our discipleship. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Jesus is interested in that. Truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When we become the real deal, authentic disciples. How do we know that we're genuine, true disciples? If we bear much fruit. You remember the episode in the last week of our Lord. When he comes to a barren fig tree and he's hungry. And he searches for a fig and there is no fruit to be found. What does Jesus do with that tree? He curses it. And the next day when the disciples and Jesus come around, it's all withered up. It's dried up. Just like that fig tree, our purpose is to bear fruit. In a wonderful Sunday morning class on the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Fruit of the spirit. In James 1, 22, James says, but be doers of the word and not hearers deceiving your, yourselves. So our purpose is to bear fruit for God, to be productive, to bring rich blessings in our lives uh, and to realize those blessings that God has given us. And when we become so full of those blessings, we begin to sprout. I have this old lemon tree in my backyard. And you would look at the, the bark on the tree and know that this is, this is, is an, an old thing. And you would think that <laughs> His productive years are long, long past. But for some strange reason, the thing just keeps on going. And every year, the, the, the number of lemons is just unbelievable. I'm going to be like that tree. Just keep on bearing and bearing and bearing more and more fruit. When we come to terms with the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us, Ephesians 2, 8. The immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us, we begin to reproduce. In fact, I would suggest we cannot help but reproduce. Our lives are so full of blessings that, that we exude those blessings and um, touch others' lives for good. But how do we do that? Only if we abide in Christ. You don't cut a branch away from the tree, or in this case, away from the vine, and then try to apply human engineering to that branch, independent of the vine, have a rally. Okay, go for it. Get some fruit. Come on. Let's, and, 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 and have thousands of people just kind of cheering that, that branch on, independent of the vine. It doesn't work like that. Nor can you apply human engineering apart from that that vine and that, that that branch miraculously just produces some fruit has to be connected this is not something forced or engineered in a mechanical way it's a natural process built in this into the spiritual dna when we are connected to the vine and the word abide is found 10 times in this section 10 times but we are to abide in christ his words are to abide in us and so on that we are deeply and intimately connected with Jesus, and when we abide in him, fruit-bearing is automatic. 
We don't have to work at it. We don't have to force it artificially. It just comes. It's like Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, 14, beginning. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit and in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When you're full of God, because you're rooted and grounded in the vine, fruit will just pop out everywhere. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Abide in Christ and the fruit will come. But how do we abide in Christ? He's not here. He was crucified. He went back to the Father, right? When his words abide in us, his love abides in us, and the Father's pruning is part of our existence here. Then Christ will abide in us. Christ's words, Christ's words, ancient words. But they cleanse us. Verse 3, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And they not only clean us, they transform us. Through a process of reading, reflection, memorization, meditation, when these precious ancient words become part of us, then Christ himself dwells in us and we in him. They're not just words on paper, but we have the living word, the logos, in our hearts, and we are connected to him, and his words are transformative. They fundamentally change who we are, and Jesus dwells in us through them. And Christ's love. When his words dwell in us, it's hard to push out his love and to create a barrier against that love permeating our being and who we are. Because if you're thinking about the word and you're memorizing the word and you're meditating on the word, that love becomes part of the process. We love because he first loved us, First John 4.19. Again, the same author of the Gospel of John. We talked... Last time, John 17, verse 23, how Jesus prays that the world would know that the Father loves you just as he has loved me. And we know God, the Father, loves Jesus, and yet he loves us like that. And, and right here, Jesus says in verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know how much he loves you? The little kids know. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. The word abides in us. The love of Jesus abides in us. And when that permeates us, then Jesus dwells in us and we in him. And we abide in the vine. We love him in return. And we love those whom he loves. And this final point, the Father's pruning. This has been a great lesson so far, but, but now we get to the... <laughs> don't want to hear about the pruning part, right? The part where your faith is tested and exposed to pain. The part where you face adversity. The part where you have trials and pain applied to your life. And James 1, 2 through 4 talks about counting it all joy when that happens. Don't, don't despise it or think you have to run away from it as if it's a bad thing happening in your life. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
Listen to me carefully. Trials are the instruments through which God makes us more holy and helps us deepen our relationship with him so that we can bear more fruit. We may, and it's, it's not a matter of, of doing something wrong. When you are pruned, it's because you're doing something right. Verse 2 says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be bear more fruit. It's not because you're doing something wrong that, that uh, pruning comes, it's because you're doing something right. And you go from fruit to more fruit. Your productivity increases. Just when you think you're doing all you can do, I've got this small basket of fruit and how wonderful and how beautiful it is. And Jesus says that basket's not big enough. Instead of a small basket, let's make it a giant basket. In his book, Secrets of the Vine, Bruce Wilkinson tells a story about a friend of his named George. And at midway point in his career as a minister, Mr. Wilkinson, in his conversation with George, George says, you're right where you need to be, but you're at the point of making a significant change in your life. He said, um, when you first started out, You were so moved and motivated by your relationship with God, but your confidence was down here. Your relationship with God provided a great source of joy, but your confidence was pretty low. And then you began to learn new things, and you began to apply the lessons learned, and, and then you had two sources of joy, your relationship with God and your your professional confidence, your proficiencies in, in doing ministry work. And then what, what's happened in the meantime is your, is your confidence continued to grow. And um, people have praised you for the good things that you've done. And But the problem is you can't have the full joy that God wants you to have from your confidence and from your contributions to the kingdom. They come not from this part of the equation, but from this one. And what you need to do is let your instincts take over here now. And then find your joy in the Lord. And when you rely less on self going forward and more in God, then the package will be complete. Because what happens when, and all of us can relate to this if we're successful at all in life. Because whether it's professionally or climbing the corporate ladder or doing whatever we do to become successful, we may de-emphasize this part and emphasize, and it's unsustainable. This is unsustainable. But this is sustainable. When you find your joy and your fulfillment and your peace with God, then all of these things we talked about today can happen. You see yourself as, as, as connected to a vine that is providing nourishment and anything that is of value in your life. You truly are connected. And when your life becomes this this richness of God's blessings, then you, you begin bearing a rich harvest. I can relate to Mr. Wilkinson's illustration. In my personal self-appraisal, which is not as valuable in some cases as other people's appraisal, but in my personal self-appraisal, I think I've done some of the best teaching and preaching 
of my whole life, these last couple of years. But it has occurred to me that that can very easily happen. And I want this to happen. I want the best sermon that I ever preach to be the one that is my life. And it hasn't always been so. But I know if I get that part right, everything else will fall into place. When your life becomes your best sermon, your masterpiece, you are blessed in order to be a blessing, and you have this best blessed life because it's the best life, and it's a life loaded, rich in spiritual fruit, which in turn puts your joy off the charts. But you got to be connected. We take this lesson to heart that Jesus teaches these disciples on the night in which he's about to leave them the next morning. And we truly will be transformed. And we find ourselves all alone in a room. As I found myself last night as I was thinking about these things. The thought occurred to me in a powerful way. Jesus is here. And I'm not alone. And I want that thought to permeate my every being from this moment forward. And if Jesus is here, then my life will be abundant in the fruit that I bear for him. Are you subject to the invitation call of Christ? You need to get connected to the vine. Become one of the branches and start bearing the fruit. As God works powerfully in your life, put your faith and trust in Jesus, be baptized into him and walk with him until you, until he calls you home to glory. It's the best life you could possibly live. You need to get back on track. Then do it. Whatever your need is, get connected, stay connected and bear that precious fruit. Let's stand and sing song of invitation.